Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to talk to you about something a little bit different. I'm not going to mention agile organizations. I'm not going to mention DevOps. I'm going to talk about apps. Aqua is a not-for-profit trade association. We've been around since about 2004, working on testing standards for apps. Um, my background is in telecoms, uh, about 30 years working in telco, last 20 years or so working for Orange. I started off developing systems, back-end systems, warehousing systems, systems that help them build the network. Ended up as the IT architect and moved across to start helping uh, developers deliver apps. And I ran the Orange App Shops, which is where I got involved with Aqua. But there's a lot to learn in today's um, mHealth world about apps. And there's a lot to learn from what's happened in the past. At Aqua, we believe that apps have really yet to hit their peak. There's still a lot of poor quality apps out there. There's still a lot of apps that aren't doing all the things that they need to. There's still a lot of people who go about testing their apps in entirely the wrong way. I go to these conferences and I'm told every junior doctor is writing an app. And I go to some conferences and listen to uh, cardiac specialists trying to tell us how to test the apps and how to rate the apps and how to do that. And that's entirely wrong. This has all been done before. You can use what's gone before you and concentrate on testing the service that your app is delivering, not the app itself. So Aqua provides straightforward, practical guidance as to how, to, uh, how you can go about doing that fundamental testing. But before we go into that, Let's see what we can learn from classic engineering. My background is as an engineer. Um, I suspect many people here haven't had that sort of engineering training. That's certainly true in many of the app conferences I talk to. So let's have a look at some of these epic failures of the past. You might recognize this first one, particularly apt in this hotel, the Titanic. So um, 1912, April 14th, Titanic disaster. Who here can tell me what happened with the Titanic? Why did it sink? It's a beautiful ship. No one knows why it sank? It was incorrectly. Wrong. It was the unsinkable ship. It was beautiful. It had two sister ships, the um, Olympic, and I think the other one was called something like the Colossus. They were fine, absolutely fine. They were architected in exactly the same way. No, because it was unsinkable. But, sorry? Bad leadership, interesting. Well, it was, it was a, a beautiful ship. I mean, absolute sort of pinnacle of its age. We saw about the Gartner hype. You know, this really was the pinnacle of this sort of engineering. But what it didn't, uh, what it didn't account for was the icebergs and what was going on. So I said there was a sister ship. The sister ship had an interesting, um, interesting history as well. And we'll talk about that in just one moment. But in terms of icebergs, the captain uh, uh, didn't see the iceberg. It was a horrible thing. How many, you know, 1,250 people died there. Really, really bad. You can see some of the theories about what happened, how the ship sliced the iceberg on the side, broke in half, and sank. Map at the bottom is quite interesting because he was racing. He thought, maiden voyage of a ship. Let's take it as fast as we possibly can. Hmm, perhaps not his best idea. So, the result of his race was, as we know, but why did it sink? There's often theories about bad rivets, bad steel. I mentioned the sister ship, the Colossus, uh, the Olympic, sorry. The Olympic had actually had an accident. It was coming out of a port alongside a Navy ship, and they were both turning. And the Olympic didn't turn as fast as the Navy ship did. The Navy ship crashed into the Olympic, opened two of the watertight compartments, but of course the Olympic did not sink. It was absolutely fine. The Olympic then went back into port, into, into Belfast, where the Titanic was being built. And some theories say they used the good steel and the good rivets to repair the Olympic, and then used poor, poor quality stuff on the Titanic, okay? Well, that's a bit of a lame excuse. One of the bigger reasons, poor leadership we heard earlier, when they saw the iceberg, what did they do? They put the engines into reverse, they put the rudder hard over to the right. Now, I don't know if any of you have any sort of sailing or, or boating experience. Effectively, what you then do is you lose complete control. 
Now, we already know that the Olympic didn't steer very well. It didn't turn as fast as the Navy ship. So they have now lost full control of their ship. The captain didn't know how to drive his boat. So instead of hitting that iceberg head on, they sliced the side of the ship open and opened six watertight compartments. It was designed to stay afloat if four were completely flooded. So their design, the ship is the best lifeboat, considered unsinkable. It was a bit of an arrogant design. So if you throw things out there and think, yeah, this is wonderful, nobody's ever going to do anything wrong with it. So what happened was, the design of being unsinkable, the design of, well, you'll only, only uh, sink if you lose too many compartments, was confounded by the fact that the captain sliced open the side of the ship instead of hitting straight on. Had he rammed the iceberg, he may not have sunk. In fact, the Olympic stayed afloat for a good number of years and eventually rammed a U-boat and survived that experience. So effectively, it was user error. They didn't know how to drive their boat. Taybridge, Scottish Taybridge. How many uh, are aware of the Scottish Taybridge disaster? A few of you. This one was a railway. Um, again, it was um, a, a, a horrible thing. Beautiful bridge, but um, fairly disastrous. So 1879. Again, we're going a long way back here. Wind loading was uh, what the engineer, Mr. Bush, had uh, looked for, and he thought, no, it's not, not important. I don't need to worry about that. And the disastrous uh, consequences of that, the railway, uh, uh, the train going over it uh, went into the river, and a lot of people died. And that was the, uh, the engine as they pulled it out of the river. There are theories about, oh, the train was going too fast, it was too windy, there's all sorts of different things. But what actually caused this disaster? Well, partly, perhaps, cheap construction. Bush was under very tight budgets, tight timelines. His masters said, you have to build this bridge cheaply, you have to build it quickly, and you have to make sure it's done now. Train was perhaps going too fast. Was the design right with wind speed in the, in the uh, area? Did he ignore best practice? Did he put price in front of quality? Well, actually, that's probably it, yes, because it was done on the cheap. Everything was done cheap. This was poor implementation. So both of these really come back to thinking about what you might learn in first-year engineering. How many people here know what I would mean by the devil's triangle or the project manager's triangle? A few. Oh, more than, more than I expect. I, I, again, sometimes when I do this at app conferences, I get people standing up and thinking, wow, this is the best thing since sliced bread. But this is really engineering 101. In any situation, in any engineering solution you have, whether that's an app, whether it's a full system, whether it's whatever it may be, you are always balancing time, quality, and cost, no matter how you do it. Whether you're agile, whether you're DevOps, whether you're waterfall, whether you're what, that is the balance. It is basically engineering is the art of compromise. Nothing is ever perfect. You have to balance time, quality, and cost. In app development, that becomes features versus speed and customer requirements and quality. It's the same set of compromises you have to make. Whether you compromise on time, whether you compromise on feature set, whether you compromise on quality, you make those decisions. Engineering is the art of compromise. Today, we are building solutions very much as we have done since we've been building the Titanic or the Tay Bridge. And your designers, your engineers make these choices on a daily basis. Methodologies do help. You see, I would come back to, uh, back to topic. I'm not just always talking about the Titanic. Uh, development methodologies uh, uh, help you get there faster and better. Agile and DevOps, wonderful. To me, the key thing about Agile and DevOps is that you get closer to the, u closer to the user, so you understand more about what's going on with your product, and you give your team ownership of that project and that product. Test room development, great. That's really good. Behavior-driven development, again, even better. You know, all good stuff. And all of these things, adding to the automation that you get in your functional testing, really does improve the speed of delivery. So what's the problem? Why am, I, why am I standing here talking about this? Because functional testing alone, that most of your agile teams are doing, will not find the problems in mobile apps. They will not find performance issues when it's on the handset. They will not find the user behavior issues. 
They won't find the environment, device environment issues. Does this app work well on customers' handsets? And they won't find design issues because they're so close to it. Putting to one side the device compatibility issues, of course. I mean, that's a, another matter altogether. So we recommend you, you actually build a much better testing strategy, and you need to add a layer of acceptance testing on top of your functional testing that you're automating every night. Behave as a real user might. That complements your functional tests, and it builds on those automated tests that you're doing there. A minimum viable testing strategy. You've got your minimum viable product. You need your minimum viable testing strategy, which gives you your functional testing that you're probably doing today, your non-functional testing, performance testing, on-device behavior, device compatibility testing, effectively building up a layered testing approach. So. Layered testing is great. Yesterday I heard uh, somebody from uh, the Guardian newspapers, it was, talking in the telco session, and he was saying that they'd uh, changed all their systems around and they're now fully agile and they're delivering 80 updates a day, I think it was. He was actually reiterating the basic teaching of low coupling, high cohesion, which is, again, software engineering as taught, very basic stuff, which means... You don't let different parts of your system know about other parts of your system. You keep them separate. You design small services, and you keep everything together. Very basic stuff. People are actually coming back and saying, hey, this is wonderful. This is brand new. No, it's not. This is classic engineering. This is what you're doing, folks. I mean, how many of you here have ever seen the ISO OSI 7-layer model? Yeah, a few. A smattering. This is classic stuff. You don't try to build everything in one go. You actually look at the different things that you're delivering. I get particularly wound up about this when I see, as I say, doctors trying to test, technically test apps on handsets, because all of this has been done. We've been doing this for whatever it is, 2004. How many years is that now? 15 years, 13 years? Um, Isolair splits everything up, so you're not trying to test whether your cable's plugged together when you're trying to actually test the functionality of your app. So why aren't you doing the same when you're testing your system? Why are you going straight to end-to-end -to -end testing with a full system rather than looking at it in layers? So particularly with health apps. Now, one of the reasons I'm here today is I've been working with the European Commission um, and industry uh, partners to build a code of conduct for privacy and security in mHealth apps. Now, this is, this, is, this is absolutely important. But before you can even get to that, people have been arguing about how to test these. How do you actually prove the medical effectiveness of an app? And they get very excited because this medical solution is being delivered by an app. And all of a sudden, they're, they're, they're terrified because it's an app. It's no different. It's no different to anything else. In the same way as you would test the service, perhaps, say, of a, I don't know, of a vaccination. A vaccination, you wouldn't start worrying about the delivery mechanism, the, um, the hypodermic needles and the syringe. You wouldn't say, because it's being delivered by a syringe, we have to test it in an entirely different way. No, you rely on the traditional ways of testing the plastic, testing the syringe, knowing that that's going to work in exactly the same way as you need to when it is an app. So in terms of designing your testing, separate out the, the app testing, which we have, from the medical testing is what we're saying. Now, Aqua provides a set of baseline testing criteria, which is effectively um, a checklist, a series of tests so you know what you need to test. For example, how well does your app on your handset perform when you have an incoming, an incoming phone call? We were testing the other day a, it was a live sports streaming app. Sound quality was superb. Picture quality was superb. The, um, uh, being able to choose between the different events was absolutely wonderful. They forgot to test what happens when you get an incoming phone call. It dropped into the background OK, and you could answer the phone, but the sound carried on playing. You end up with it with the sound down both ends of the phone call, which was no good at all. Had they gone through our baseline testing checklist, they would have found that. Once you've done that and the app is working well on the device, you can then look at testing your service end to end, and that's when you start to test the effectiveness of the delivery of the health service that you are trying to deliver. That's when your medical professionals get involved, and they don't start trying to test whether the app works on the device. Exactly as you would if this service were being delivered by any more traditional means. So don't let them get all excited about the fact that it is an app. 
Um, so we have this baseline testing criteria. Effectively, it's a QA system in a box. It gives you a, a, a very basic set of user acceptance tests. Does the app work well on the device? It has been built up through combined experience of the likes of Nokia, Motorola. Originally, we started by Motorola, Siemens, Sony Ericsson, Nokia. It's kind of depressing to think that I don't think any one of those is in business anymore. Um, but we still have their wisdom on testing, and that's embedded in the Aqua specs, and it's been upgraded uh, over the years. as a checklist of tests to find typical errors. Now, errors are absolutely typical, and developers are, are really consistent. So consistent, we've even made a, a, a postcard of the top 10 errors they always make. Um, there's some of these on the side over there. But they are completely consistent, and it is things like um, on an Android device, checking whether it's uh, uh, disrupted when you turn from one side to the other, because effectively that is a complete tear down of the app and a rebuild from the bottom up. So it's a fairly uh, a stressful event, shall we say, in an app's life. Um, these have been fine-tuned over time with uh, industry expert knowledge and people like VMC, who test uh, a lot of Microsoft games, for example, are one of our key members. Um, and it's absolutely free. So this is published free. You can take, it, you can take cards with you. There's some on the side, so you don't need to copy it. <laughs> Um, absolutely free, uh, free at the point of use. We get about 500 downloads of these specs every month. Um, you might say, if it's free, where does your money come from? We are a membership organization, so people join us as members, and they pay a membership fee. Um, and we keep these updated and revised, um, and you can use it online, or there's, a, there's an online tool, or you can download it as a PDF, or you can take it and build it into your own test specs if you want to. You're entirely free to do that. It's all under Creative Commons license. Looks a bit like this. Each test is laid out on a page. It tells you uh, what you're trying to test, how to set the test up, the conditions that you should have for the, uh, for the test, the uh, expected te uh, steps to go through, and then the expected result. And you tick pass or fail at the bottom. Very straightforward. Um, we still support Windows, even though Windows don't. Um, best practice documents, we have some guidance as to how to go about designing your app, how to use the device, how not to go against the design principles of the device itself. Uh, useful, they perhaps need updating these days, but uh, they're still good. And we now have um, some accessibility testing criteria. These help the developers go through scenarios that they probably wouldn't think of for themselves. Can you use the app well if you perhaps have color blindness, if you have limited hearing, limited vision? How well does it work with the inbuilt screen reader on the device? Your developers are focused on the functionality. They're focused on delivering the best medical service they can. They are not experts in all of these areas. These are the documents that are built by the experts from the telco industry that give you that knowledge straight off, so you don't need to reinvent it. So we recommend starting off with good design principles, Aqua best practice guidelines, test, test, and test again in layers, functional testing as you're coding, as you're building up your app, interoperability testing as you get your different components of it, run effective customer acceptance tests. Now we strongly recommend that you use third parties to test your apps. Once you have a working system, get it in the hands of somebody else. You cannot proofread your own documents. Your developers are too close to the functionality of the app. They will use it as they expect to use it. They will not slice open the side of the ship. They will ram the iceberg head on. They won't make the mistakes that users make in terms of or what they see as mistakes. They won't behave as real users behave necessarily. They might do. They might be absolutely brilliant. But they're probably not. And since we know they always make the same mistakes, they probably won't. Structure and layer your tests, use the aqua testing criteria, and after technical testing, test the service that you're delivering. It's all very obvious stuff, really, when you think about it. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about what the uh, European Commission is doing um, and about data protection and privacy. They wanted to help increase the uptake of mHealth apps. They wrote a green paper in 2014 that talked about the value of the health market through apps, through delivery in this, in this way. And it was a huge amount of money. I can't remember the numbers. I mean, it, it's so big, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's just an enormous potential. 
but they felt that there was a massive barrier in terms of trust. And I think there's a massive barrier in terms of trust, not only for users, but also for medical professionals. Again, that's why you don't want them to be testing the apps. But in the meantime, we also have GDPR sweeping across Europe in 2018. Mm, it's kind of interesting. Privacy gets serious under GDPR. I think we've probably heard before 4% of global turnover and 20 million euros, I think, is the, uh, are the fines you can have under GDPR. Basic principle, you can't do anything unless it says you can. Fines are what I would call eye-wateringly high. And it's yet to be fully defined, which makes it a little bit difficult. And, but do you even comply with the current rules? I bet many of you don't. Do you even know all the current rules? You probably don't. <laughs> Maybe you do know all this already, so we'll move on. I'm not going to talk to you about GDPR so much. I'm going to talk to you about the code of conduct. Trust and user confidence is what they're trying to build. So the code of conduct gives your developers a very straightforward set of ways to... Uh, things that they can and can't do with the user's data in a health uh, context. It talks about the, the, the fact that health data is one of the more significant private areas that, that uh, uh, is considered in GDPR. And this has been done with uh, um, the industry and the commission, and it is currently with the Article 29 Working Group, which is the global group of data protection authorities in each of the 28 countries. And you can see some about it uh, uh, on that link there, but uh, there'll be another link later. So if you look for it, you can find it. Uh, hopefully, it'll come through and come out from the, um, from the uh, uh, Article 29 group. It's been there once already. We've had it back. We've made some changes. We put it in. So there will be a working code of conduct. Now, it is going to be a voluntary conduct. It's something that people can... Um, can say that they comply with, which is good. There's it's nothing uh, uh, compulsory about it. But it covers areas of consent, of purpose limitation, privacy by design. I mean, these are all great words. What do they really mean? It's explained in the Code of Conduct. Um, all of these things um, are particularly key and absolutely vital if you're going to deliver health apps. And this Code of Conduct helps you get it right. Practical issues in each of the areas. It's written to be accessible to developers. You do not need to be a lawyer to read it, which I think is quite vital. Every time I look at uh, uh, the full GDPR, GDPR information, I get very lost very quickly. Um, it is compatible with GDPR. It adds examples, explanations, and relevance to your app developers. Um, and it is a voluntary scheme with self-declaration uh, of adherence um, but there will be policing to check, so when people say they adhere to the Code of Conduct, their apps will be checked to see if that is the case. But let's go back to epic fails, because they're far more interesting. We saw some of those disasters, um, but surely they can't be happening now. One that I really like, Tacoma Narrows. This was 1940. It's another bridge. Um, aeroelastic flutter. This is where you get the uh, wind along the river, uh, which doesn't have to be that strong a wind. Beautiful bridge when it opened. Um, doesn't have to be that strong a wind, but it can have some devastating effects. Now, again, they got this slightly wrong. They hadn't looked at it. And when you look at that, that is scary. I mean, that is just absolutely frightening, the way that is moving. And you might not be able to see there's a car in the distance there. Um, but it shows you how much that bridge is moving. Oh, they closed some of the bridges in the UK, the Seven Bridge, for sort of wind, but it doesn't do anything like this. Um, and you can see the sides on here are very solid, and that was part of why it had this, this effect. The guy at the bottom there, just casually walking away, I, I would be running. Um, he seems absolutely mad. I think there's another chap here. It's not even that windy when you look at how he's being blown about. He's worried about his car, but he shouldn't have parked it there. I mean, it's, it's just a bit... <laughs> Absolutely bonkers. So uh, it, this then very quickly falls apart and the whole thing just collapses. So you can see how a, a small unforeseen consequence causes a really catastrophic collapse into the river. Um, and it was such a shame because it was a very pretty bridge. Beautiful service. Shame about the implementation. The collapse was disastrous. New bridge, you can see this one hasn't got solid sides. 
It's still there. But in the software world, these disasters don't happen, do they? Surely not. 1996, Ariane 5, it had a, um, they upgraded the systems. They had a 64-bit floating number that talked about the velocity. It was, uh, it was put into a 16-bit signed number, very technical little problem, but it felt the, the, the rocket decided it was going at a negative speed and decided it had to abort. It blew itself up because of a programming error in terms of the size of the, size of the word that you use for a number. Windows blue screen of death, which is very embarrassing, but when you stick it on a building this big, it's even worse. <laughs> or you can take the whole building if you want. We see these errors all the time. And if you're flying on a plane, you just get, well, I mean, how embarrassing is that? These guys simply haven't done enough testing. They haven't looked enough at what's going on. They haven't followed best practice. They haven't taken the advice that is freely available for them. Apple do it. Apple Maps. Remember the Apple Maps? They hadn't tested outside Cupertino. Didn't work in the rest of the world. <laughs> iOS 8.01, which great, turned your phone into a brick. <laughs> Skype do it. Amazon Cloud does it. Delta Airlines. Now, that's a classic. They changed all of their flight um, instructions, the pilot checklists, onto iPads. Yes, modern technology. That really works. They had a bug, and every flight was grounded because they couldn't go through their pre-flight checklists. So you have to be very careful on this. It's about risk mitigation. It's about looking at the risks that you're taking, looking at how you do your testing, how you do your conformance to make sure that you're actually not putting you and your company or your patients or your users into a risk situation that is unacceptable. Twitter went out for five hours. That's what you got. Something is technically wrong. Wonderful. I love it. So I'll end quickly. We have uh, three tips. Functional regression testing should be automated as much as possible. But don't waste time looking to automate too much. There are always going to be things that you cannot automate. Anybody who tells you all testing can be automated is either fooling themselves or lying. Choose your tools carefully. The right tool for the right task. You will need multiple tools. Again, my apologies to any tools vendors in the room. If they tell you their tool will do everything, they're either deluded or lying. Have somebody else do some testing on your app before you let it loose. You cannot proofread your own documents, and I dread finding a spelling mistake on that one. I always do it. And have a well-defined, right-sized pre-release QA step. Do not think that you can deploy things straight into a live environment without doing some real QA on it. That is a fundamental error. You may not have had a problem yet, but you will do one day, and you don't want that error to be titanic. We have the top 10 errors. There's some postcards on the sides. There's some postcards about Aqua on the side as well. If you want to use some of the resources that we make available, you are very welcome to do so. Um, and we very much say that uh, software engineering can learn from traditional engineering. And if your guys aren't engineers, then you need to start looking at some of your processes. Learn from the guidance. Learn from the experience and best practice. And Aqua standards embody experience from the app industry since about 2004. <coughs> with contributors from AT&T, Orange, Vodafone. You see them all there. There's a whole load of resources there, um, Aqua resources, but, uh, testing criteria, best practice guidelines. I just want to mention the AT&T Arrow tool. They call it the um, application, no, the video optimizer tool now. It's a really, really excellent tool. Again, it's free to use. It allows you to analyze the way your app uses data on the network. Why are they doing that? Well, they're the network, so they want your apps to run effectively. They showed us a music download app that was just eating the battery, absolutely eating the battery. They couldn't work out why. They thought it was the music downloading, but it wasn't, actually. It was a keep alive strategy, just a ping every so often that the app sent back to its server saying, hello, I'm still here, was timed exactly wrong so that the radio in the device never managed to go into its sleep mode, was always hot. So it was wasting power, keeping the radio on full power all the time, just through a ma badly timed keep alive. And you couldn't find it except by using a tool like this. Uh, European Code of Conduct, M Health Privacy and Security, and use independent testing from trusted organizations like CTTI, VMC, ITech Labs, CAICT. You can find a list of them on the Aqua website. And don't make those titanic errors. Thank you.